Okay. Okay. Um, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, good night, wherever you are around the world. Um, thank you all for joining us. I'm Tim Medland, um, curatorial consultant at Poster House, um, which is the US's first and only poster museum, dedicated museum. Tonight, we're joined by Mel Meehan, military poster expert, um, who will be talking um, through a show which I've curated called With My Little Eye, based on spy posters, um, allied spy posters from the Second World War. Um, while Mel is talking, if you have questions, if you can put them into the chat, I will look at them and vocalize them um, for Mel at what seems like the appropriate point. Um, I think somebody's already enabled the closed captioning, so that's good. Um, and if you have any other questions, either I or my colleague Salvador um, will um, interject and try and help. Um, oh, I've just got somebody saying, Ruthie and Carl can't seem to connect it with you. Um, okay, Salvador's on that. Okay, with that, Mel, over to you. Well, hello, everybody, and thank you for having me. I think it'd be fun to talk about, oh my goodness, there they are, um, espionage posters, but I wanted to make a general comment first. And that is that these posters were created before there was television, really, because people had televisions, or certainly before the internet. And when the government, the overall big picture is, wanted to talk to the people, how would they do it? And as Tim so rightly pointed out, the British tried to do it with humor because they started out by saying, if you think your neighbor is a spy, let us know. And the result was, no, we won't, because that's like opening people's mails. That's what, not what proper people do. So then they discovered this cartoonist for Punch who did it with humor. And then it was acceptable. Plus, it was the average person involved in something important in the war, perhaps. But in general, um, spies were not the problem. They, in fact, in the middle of the war, as Tim pointed out, in Britain, they, and these are British posters, they thought they had rounded up all the spies or had them under their control, but they continued to put out this careless talk type poster because it involved everybody and it had a certain kind of folksy humor. And that, I think, uh, is the essence of, of <laughs> most British posters. And these are typical, typical examples, because you see Hitler, little faces of Hitler all around, for instance, is very, very typical phone booth. Let's look at the next slide. Ah, uh, be like dad, keep mom. Um, there's some interesting references here. One is that maybe uh, it's mom who gives away all the secrets. And this is a double entendre that keeping mom uh, <laughs> also means to be quiet and women are thought to be uh, the gossips. But the whole place, the, Outside the window is gray and what was going on. I mean, you know, there's a certain, it's funny, but it's not quality to it. And the little face is kind of quizzical, but it's the same theme. Careless talk costs lives. Let's look at the next one. Ah, this is extremely interesting. The artist for this, Paul Collin, was very, very much associated with um, Josephine Baker. He did all her posters. And so this was a, a, a well-known, well-known artist, very prolific. He did 200, if you can believe it, posters a year. But here's the very interesting part. There is a figure of a man as a, drawn as a shadow. In Mein Kampf, Hitler said, 
I think that the Allies did terrific propaganda, referring, of course, to World War I. And there, you see a figure that reappeared in German espionage posters because Hitler, who fancied himself as an artist, remember that was his first calling, Hitler was an artist. And so he was interested in what artists did. And that figure was stolen directly for a large series of um, German posters called, under the rubric Fiend, F-E-I-N-D, Hort, H-O-R-T, Mitt. You can look it up and you'll find a whole, one, whole series and they all have that same figure. So when Hitler advised people to look at Allied propaganda as successful, this is a perfect example of how it worked. And it's a very, very striking poster. Unlike all the Josephine Baker and kind of, you know, crazy dancing girl posters. Here, it's serious because it was done at a time when uh, war against Germany was declared, but hadn't really heated up. And so, but they were already extremely, the French, that is to say, of course, were extremely uh, worried about, about um, espionage. Next slide. Ah, this is another one that is pretty interesting. They assassinate enveloped in the, in the folds of our flag. So there is the French flag, that's the tricolor. And um, behind it is a figure of what I'm sure is meant to be Stalin, but it also has a sort of anti-Semitic figure features standing behind another figure. Now it is absolutely true that a lot of the figures of the resistance were communists. They were tremendous contributors uh, to, to undermining German, the German, German occupation once the German occupation started. But I think that this poster, and this is just a guess, Tim, I'd be interested to know what you think, is uh, an anti-communist poster. Yes, I mean, um, as you say, he looks like Stalin um, with, more anti-Semitic figures, but it, it's the fact that through the flag you can see um, his hand guiding exactly the, right. The, it's a, um, yes, the gun of the figure and the the Vichy government, the French government um, at this point in time. So at this point, the Nazis had invaded um, and they installed a puppet puppet government, and the Vichy government was rabidly anti-communist. That they shared. That's exactly right. The Nazi. That's what I think we're looking at. And um, so they they were able to focus, or they tried to focus the population on anti-communism. So don't worry about those Nazis, just focus on the communists. Exactly right. And that's what we're looking at. And the next slide. Ah the German spies, watch out. And you can see, you'll see this same gesture of the ear being sort of put forward and certain other posters. It, it's, it also appears in an American poster we're going to see shortly. The interesting point to me is one that Tim discovered, which was, and I didn't even know that the Nobody in the German army could wear glasses, but they could wear monocles. Now, monocles were an emblem of a Prussian officer who were supposed to be the toughest of all possible um, German foes and particularly oh, ruthless and cunning and well-trained. So there's that aspect of this poster as well. And, and so honestly, when you, when you are trying to get someone not to talk, how would you do it? 
you, you would, would you try and scare them? Because to me, this is a very peculiar image in a certain way, because it's, the monocle is Prussian and, danger, and spells danger, yet it's sort of a baby face. It's just an interesting uh, characteristic of this particular poster. Let's look at the next one. Ah, oh, <laughs> this is for people who <laughs> would really like it spelled out because <laughs> uh, here you see two people in a bar, typically, uh, and we'll see more of that idea later. And a German spy is hiding behind that newspaper where the A is of he talked. And you see this in other uh, espionage posters. In fact, it reappears in German posters. Not only does the shadow man reappear, but spies behind newspapers. Well, that's what you see here. And to make it just clear, she sails at midnight. And if you know what time she's sailing, then you can aim at her. Now, the silly part of that, well, maybe not the silly part, but it, it assigns these two people to absolutely being responsible for a for an disaster. And so uh, it's interesting that most espionage posters relate, and that's true of American posters as well. Let's say, let, confine it to American posters, to sailors because they could do this, they could say in bars, wind ships sail, and perhaps then the convoy would know exactly where they are, et cetera, and disaster uh, would ensue. As a poster, I think this is relatively uh, uninteresting, but it's uh, declarative, let's put it that way. Let's look at another one. Ah, here <laughs> is a very amazing caricature of Goebbels, and Goebbels was the Minister of Propaganda. And uh, as you know, he, he had, oh, I'm sorry. He had a, um, well, here he's hideously caricatured, but he also had a club foot. He was deformed, but that's not what they're showing here. They're showing him as, as some kind of spectral snake-like figure uh, emerging from a it's, a, it's a very, hideous caricature and mixed up with, with snake, snaky elements, as we say, and also ordering you to kill it. And next. Can I just, um, we have a, a question. Is the snake getting out of the egg to kill rumors or should we kill the rumors to prevent the snake is the question. Huh, both. Yes, I mean, the, the Goebbels was, you know, a, a master of disinformation. Yes. Um, a, a exactly. Evil human being, beside the point. But so the snake, the, the snake is is the rumors. He's he, he is the the um, personification of the rumors which have been created. Yes, exactly right. Exactly right. And the next. Ah. And here we have Hitler. Uh, these posters were, were organized by Seagrams and paid for by Seagrams because they had bars along the East Coast and they thought that people who uh, were drinking Seagrams might, and they were stevedores, et cetera, might uh, reveal again the, the uh, sailing times of ships. And that was a big, big problem. And so it's interesting to see that <laughs> even in this friendly tavern, there may be enemy ears. And that, do you know a lot about the history of spies in America? There weren't that many, Jim. And nonetheless, I guess they thought that this was its uh, a, a patriotic duty, really. Uh, but again, 
So many things were aimed at sailors. We'll look at two posters later, interestingly enough, that show soldiers in combat. But that's rare because what could a person control information? And the information would be about, uh, about ship sailing. And that's exactly what they are trying to uh, dispel here. And here, <laughs> Hitler reduced to, but so recognizable because of the mustache and the, uh, I don't know, crazy hair. It's, it's uh, interesting how reductive you can get and yet have the figure be clear, clearly recognizable. And next, ah, Heydrich. This is a poster that was the winner of, uh, a, well, I guess it's the same poster contest, but they were different categories. You, could, you, the artist, could submit your poster to the Museum of Modern Art, and it would be judged in one of eight categories. This is the enemy was one of the eight categories. And what you're looking at, again, the monocle, then the Prussian officer with, a, but here in the monocle, a man hang, hanging in the gallows. Now, this officer is meant to, and probably is, Heydrich. Heydrich was a Gauleiter of Prague. He was a terrifying person, according to everybody. He terrorized the people. He was named Hangman uh, Heydrich and Butcher Heydrich. The Czech government wanted to flex its muscle and let everybody knew, know that it was still in the war and that they could reach out and kill somebody far away in, in, their, in their home capital actually, but far away from the government in exile, which was in London. And most likely that's exactly what happened. And Heydrich, who, who was so arrogant that he drove around Prague in an open car, which is how he was assassinated. Now, this leads to a whole other series of questions. And that is, uh, was it worth it? Because apparently, according to Wikipedia, I looked it up this afternoon for fun, more than 5,000 people were killed in reprisal. The American artist Ben Sean did a uh, entire poster saying that in reprisal, all the men of Lidice, which is a village in Czechoslovakia, would be killed and the women would be sent to concentration camps and the children would be put in the appropriate places. Well, it turns out that the men were killed, but nobody ever saw any of the women and children ever again. So, it's interesting that nobody ever tried uh, assassinating anybody this high up during the war. Whether fear of reprisals it would, drove it or not, I honestly don't know. But the truth is uh, only Heydrich. He, he, he was actually only wounded and died two days later, but it doesn't matter. This poster won first prize in the Museum of Modern Art um, poster contest that year. And so it's never really been produced. It wasn't distributed to uh, the whole world. And so, so um, it's extremely, extremely rare. And as you can see, well, imagine why it, why it won. It scared people. It's American. Mel, we have a couple of questions. Um, yes. Peter's asking, were these posters regarded as propaganda by the US and Great Britain, or did they use another term? Uh, they didn't specifically 
say we're doing propaganda posters. They said they were they were information. Remember, you know, in Britain it was the Ministry of Information. Yeah, they and didn't, in America the Office of War Information. So, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's not. They didn't say they were propaganda. They in fact are, by our definition. It wasn't so advertised. And then Steve asks, do we know what happened to the auspices of the Artists for Victory? The auspices of artists when? Artists for Victory. What happened? Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't understand. I, I'm, I'm assuming it means what happened. Um, do we know what happens to the artists post-war? Oh. oh, do we know what happened to the artists post-war? In this case, I don't. In some cases, I do. Most of them were commercial artists, and so they just went straight on as they had been doing. And that's how they were found to begin with. So, so that's, yeah, I mean- That, with, that would with, be my assumption. Yeah, with the Americans, they, they, there was a formal pool of artists. So you had to apply to join the pool and then- Some of them, yes. I mean, for instance, yeah. Well, there were certain, yes, there was the Office of War Information. I'm coming to that later. And okay. who, who got to be an artist? Who got to be an artist? That's an interesting idea. And then in in, in France, the artists were very much um, commercial artists. What's interesting about the French ones, to answer the question, is that different artists, um, like Paul Collin, was not a collaborationist. So he no. produced posters at the beginning before the Nazis arrived. Then there were artists who produced posters during the Vichy slash Nazi regime. And then there were others afterwards. What is interesting is that the collaborationist artists managed to make a living post-war. Oh, yes, really especially living. in Italy. Think of uh, Gino Bocasali. He yeah. became one of the most popular artists post-war, yeah. and he was a Nazi artist. And French artists were producing yeah. for um, drinks companies and whatever else. So generally speaking, um, the artists all made their way post-war. Mm. Yep, that's what I think. That, uh, that would be my answer in, in general. And next? Ah, here's what I was talking about earlier when we saw Tasse Vu. Here are, this is in some ways a really weird poster because it's drawn, but it's made to look like a photograph. And it's this, and I guess you couldn't get a photograph of these charming people uh, together, Mussolini, Tojo, and Hitler. But here, they're all the same size, the same importance. Uh, although Mussolini has a military aspect, but still, they're all equal in, in size, equal in importance, and curiously and weirdly enough, made to look like a photo photograph of heads with them. And, and enemy ears are listening. It was a very popular thing to say. It's a, it's one of the weirder American uh, World War II posters. Next. Uh -huh. Someone talked. Now, see, for instance, here's an art artist I know about. <laughs> he did go on after the war. I didn't know about Curler, but uh, Siebel, he was definitely a commercial artist. Anyway, here again, it refers to the Navy and uh, could not be more melodramatic. And if you put, I once saw this in a movie at the end of a hall and the hall was dark and it only had a light in it. It was pretty scary. I, I forget what movie it was, but a lot of these posters have appeared by the way in various movies I know because I've given them many uh, or sold them. So this, this again implies that not only that someone talked, but guess who? You, because he's pointing at you and you know that he's about to go down for the last time. And, <laughs> and you're responsible. Next, uh, next uh, slide, please. We have a question, Mel. Yeah. Um, with the, um, 
three um, axis leaders. Uh, the question is, do you think the placement of hands left, right, right had any special meaning or it was just simply art choice? I have I have no opinion on that, so I didn't know if you had a view. Yeah, I mean, no, I don't I don't have any opinion either. I think it's an art choice, and period. It's arbitrary. Although I don't know. Sorry. And now we're looking at another American poster, a careless word, a needless sinking. Once again, here we are in the middle of the brain and all the uh, survivors are huddled in a, in a boat. It's very graphic. It could be a scene in the movie. And it also, we were talking earlier about, you know, how do the artists get into the OWI? This is a very typical OWI artist, meaning Office of War Information, who were responsible for putting out posters and putting out how many were going to be um, produced and where they were going to be sent and so on, and who the artists were gonna be. And as you will see, later it loosened up, but early in the war, and that's what we're looking at, I, this is 43, I think two or three, um, they're quite conservative. Next. Ah. Does this or does not this look like Ronald Reagan? Every time I saw it, I thought it was funny. Was it meant to be funny? I don't know. Was it meant to be Ronald Reagan? I have no idea. But this again is an Office of War information, but you know, well, this, this is completely realistic and also simple. Something else that you have to realize is that not every but he could read. And one of the big tricks, especially in World War I, but it even held to some extent to World War II. So one of the big tricks was to uh, get the point across without the text. And this one does. Next. Um, we have a question before we... Huh? Steve was asking, do we have an Office of War information now? It's so as is, is there a no, government agency? Not, no, this was a government agency uh, done during the war. It, it broke up in 1945. Yeah. But there, there, there's a comparable agency today. I don't know, but I don't think so. No, it, it, I guess if there was, they probably wouldn't be, because um, we're not officially at war with anybody. So um, no. And, and if we it, were we at war with somebody, they would they would go straight to television today. Poster would forget it. And now here's this poor sailor, uh, <laughs> although he's sort of having fun. Um, this is a sort of interesting poster, once again, aimed at protecting sailors. And you know that something lovey dovey is going on, and the figures form a heart but it's unsafe. There were a lot of venereal disease posters done that were similar and they had a sort of very pretty, in some cases, not so pretty, but never mind, a temptress. And in these uh, posters, it was put in barracks because it was extremely important for soldiers not to get venereal disease uh, or, <laughs> And this is what can also happen because then they can't go home. The US government posture was that any stale or soldier or anybody, airman, that had venereal disease could not go back into the United States to protect the health of women. So this was a real concern. Next. We have a, a question. Um, what, what's wrong with his skin? And I, I think that's just the way it's drawn. That, that's just the way the poster's coming. No, there's nothing. I mean, he's meant to be super cute and she's super cute. It's, it is one of the features of the American posters that in broad speaking, the hot soldier is, um, you know, it's in the same way that um, American TV presenters tend to be rather more photogenic than um, European ones that, that they're chosen for that. The, the posters here are very much, 
you know, the, the soldier looking at you to make you feel guilty tends to be um, a fairly good looking one. Can I just ask if you have a question, can you put it in the Q&A line, not in the chat, because I'm alternating between the two. Um, but if I miss one, it's easier if it's in the Q&A rather than the chat, if it is a question. Thank you very much. Sorry, please go ahead, Mel. No, well, let's please go ahead. Uh, we'll go ahead to the next poster. Uh -huh. This is Atherton. He too, uh, at one point, won something in the Museum of Modern Art. Now, you wouldn't see a scene like this. This one, the previous one, all show, you know, sort of a very limited, they, they try to look real. And you would not see a helmet and a cartridge belt just hooked on a cross. You'd see a name and so on. But again, they're trying to assign blame to the woman. And after, it, this is a very interesting poster in the sense that, again, look how simple it is. It's as if it's on a desert, but it's got to be, where could it be? It's, it's, there's no war zone, no anything. Again, it's pared down, made the simplest you possibly could because the, the cross is really shiny if you look at it. Uh, it's both very real in the sense that this too is an OWI poster. And so therefore it's conservative, it's real. It's not taking any chances that you don't know what it is. And uh, on the other hand, it's very surreal. It's, it's just out there in the desert somehow, but it is, you know it isn't. And the next poster, this is fun looking at all these posters. Ah, uh, see, sailors are in for it. And, but this is very theatrical. This is a uh, scene, it's, it's like a still from a movie. And those, that sort of, Sailor's hat he has on a little tiny wings, and, and he he is it's personal. This man may die if you talk too much. This is actually a photograph, and and not as the earlier one we saw uh, painted to look like a photograph. Next, oh, very interesting, and the idea that. Poster House owns this poster is so cool because it was done by the Junior Chamber of Commerce in San Francisco, which is not a large town. So how many of this could possibly exist today, even if they had some help from the WPA? This is not, emphasized, not an OWI poster. This is itself and all these caricatures, which are pretty strenuous, let's call it, um, are more directed at the Japanese than they were at the Germans. And I think that has to do with two things. The Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor and the Americans took that personally. And they were easier in a certain way to caricature because the Germans looked like Americans, whereas the Japanese were a distinct race. So here they, here they are, you know, pretty viciously counted. Uh, and you see this all over in World War II posters, not all over, that's too, too big a statement, but you see it frequently that the Japanese are caricatured and the Germans who were equally disliked, maybe not equally disliked, but disliked as well, are less often caricatures. But this has got to be a super rare poster, <laughs> given that it was, it was produced by a small group in, in San Francisco. Next. Uh-huh. See, oh, very OWI, isn't it? Because it's so, you know exactly. You just look at it and you know that this is not a good snake. This is a 
very, very bad snake and the fangs are exaggerated, but it's still very, very recognizable. You know that it's a snake and the red, the red uh, tongue, all of that is exaggerated to look scarier. And in case you don't know that this is a rattlesnake, there are little teeny lines in the back saying that this is a rattlesnake and that's the rattle rattling. And less dangerous than careless talk. Well, <laughs> possibly. Next. Mel, we have a question. Yeah. Um, are the design or aesthetic innovations that were made for the purpose of propagandizing, propagandizing the war effort in the US that carried back over or changed commercial work after the war? No, it didn't change anything after the war. The artist's style was the artist's style. And if whether they were uh, applying it to what we're now calling propagandizing, which yes, uh, they were going to, you would recognize their work if you saw an oil painting after the war. The style was there, always. Thank you. Um, Carolus Talk got there first. Here you see a soldier amidst a lot of other soldiers because all the parachutes are white. And actually parachutes uh, were all different colors depending on what supplies or people were coming down in them. And it, this is a, 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 another OWI poster, uh, very realistic, quite, quite gruesome in its way, because this is a soldier that's half alive. You suspect he is not gonna survive. And that, and that is your fault. Careless talk got there first. Next. Yes, this is one of the few uh, posters that show combat because they didn't usually, it wasn't as easy to assign blame for just chatting and you know fooling around for things that happen in combat in the field to soldiers. It, it was harder to, to pin down what could have been said that would lead to somebody shooting somebody on the front lines. And I think in this case, you are seeing uh, something else that's meant on purpose, meant to be seen. And that is the kindness and the care that Americans give their f fellow warriors. And they're here, he's carrying off the field, but very worried about him. But did he catch? Hell, because someone must have talked. This is a, you know, this is an attempt to control events that is really, really usually beyond uh, the purview of the average person. Next. Aha, uh -huh. but wanted for murder. <laughs> There's a funny thing written on the back of it, of this poster that says, oh, this is a clever poster because it shows the shrewdness of, these, of this woman. And uh, again, you see it like, you know, keep mom, she's not so dumb. Um, women being assigned a, a big share of, of what happened during the war. And here, this one is murder, a murderer. That is different. It's not Luzka, you know, she specifically is murdering someone and she is meant to look very cute, but very cruel. She's another one of these tempting women that you have to watch out for. Next. Can I just say something? Um, mm -hmm. Jean, Jean's made a very good point about the, uh, the, um, oh, the Japanese, uh, the San Francisco part, um, poster and um the obviously it's it's a deeply racist poster yes yes obviously the american response of interning um people of japanese descent yes. whether they were american citizens or not was deplorable actually about the worst thing the americans did in the war so yes it was um 
it, we we debated whether to have the poster in um but it was representative of what was done and um as mel said the americans were the only ones who actually had anti-japanese propaganda posters yes. all the, the brits were also fighting against the japanese um they were not viewed as potential spies in the uk and this is um potential spy posters to be fair there were no documented japanese spies in the us at all so these were um venal um they were designed for a purpose but the purpose was less to warn people about spies than to um create fear of the japanese um and i would just say on this poster this is the fact mel highlighted but it is the fact this woman is wanted for murder not not in involuntary manslaughter all the other posts exactly have you know basically you shouldn't talk because accidents happen this one is like oh no she did it deliberately this is um misogynistic in a in a very special way yes good point anyhow let Thank us carry you, on Ah, very interesting. Here we have the American, Jess Slaker is the author of the artist who did this painting. And he was Danish and had, um, was appointed the official American war artist from 1942 through 44. Now, there was another person who, could have become the official American war artist. And the other person was called Norman Rockwell. And he was turned down by that office in favor of this, of, of Schleicher, which is amazing. And Schleicher, or, or rather Rockwell tried to help the war effort. He donated the four freedoms to the, um, OWI and they were turned down. So they were made the cover of the Saturday Evening Post. They were sent on a whole tour all around the United States. They were the most popular images ever. And then finally they relented and, and made the Four Freedoms a poster. But it's interesting to look at Schlaker's work and think about Rockwell and they were contemporary or contemporary people. And what do you think the difference between the two was? To me, the Rockwell signature thing is in a way sort of folksy and at home and Americana. And Schlager is slightly different. He wasn't really American after all. And you don't see that sort of uh, down home character that you do see in in Rockwell. It's interesting to think about how how that office worked. I I find it fascinating because some of these details are wonderful. Look at the side of the uh, bayonet, the way it's put in, and the light that's on it. It's beautiful, really, or on his hand. And, and the expression is one of great wariness because he's battle wise and you know he's been through a lot, but he's still that same sturdy guy. Not, you know, it's, it's an interesting, uh, very interesting comparison, Schlager and Rockwell. Next. Yes, this again, American poster, OWI, we're back there. Uh, here is a hand, everything is very realistic to the point of being quite 3D. And the uh, award, of course, was a German award from years before, and it was for this exceptional bravery, courage, etc. And now the Nazi symbol is superimposed on it. And also, when the Germans executed people, they announced it with 
orange with broadsides really with an orange background and a and black lettering to say 18 year old so-and-so was shot this morning so watch out you know i don't know if this has anything to do with that but it it, it is probably coincidence but it's interesting to see it it's very effective because it looks like it's coming out at you, which was the idea. But you see, it's also super realistic. And the next. Yes, back to sailors. And the gold star meant that the uh, person was dead and, and the soldier, in this case, a sailor, and it was put in the front window of houses because they were proud of having uh, the family of producing someone who was a hero in the, during the war. There were two kinds of flags you can put in your uh, window. One had a blue uh, star, meaning your son, and in rare cases, your daughter was uh, fighting at the front and gold when they were dead. And again, it's assigned to people talking and is very realistic. It's, it's sentimental. It's based on a, a world, mm, a very much earlier uh, painting of animals, a British landseer, maybe you know him, uh, Tim. And this is, the, this is a reinterpretation uh, for World War II. Next. And that um, that's finished. the whole thing. That's the whole thing. We finished. This is the, the last. Oh post. darn! <laughs> this is the one that I think four million copies were made, um, um, even though it was an unsolicited yes. one sent in. Yes. So, so. Well, see, that's like the, the that's like the the four freedoms that was unsolicited. And yeah, everybody yeah. everybody loves dogs. Yeah. Um, so um, thank you very much, Mel, for sharing your expertise. Are there any other questions before we um, wrap up? You know, I'll, I'll I'll make a question. Uh, okay, well, I've, I've got you. I, I I was going to ask, but I've actually got uh, three three other questions coming. Okay. Through, so um, so um, the, one of the questions is: Are the German or Japanese or Italian or even Soviet espionage posters on display, or only U.S. posters? As I'm the curator, I'll answer that one. Um, we only have in our collection um, Allied posters. There are um, many. Um, uh axis power posters we just do not have them in the collection so that's why this um uh display is that way um the there was one country one major belligerent that never produced one single spy poster only one the germans produced lots the russians produced them japan no okay there aren't japan Japanese spy posters. They're like, but you know, they're posters from around the world. They're on display in World War II museums, of course, not just American, often. Um, and there's another question here talking about leaking military plans. How common was it for normal citizens to have access to any military info? Which is not a, common at all. No, it's uh, but people. I mean, a, a ship uh, sailing schedules would be about it, really. I mean, yeah. it wasn't common. And here's what I think is interesting. Who today buys, who buys espionage posters? Go on. The Tell answer, because I saw them. <laughs> and it's people, you, you cannot believe. My favorite person who bought espionage posters was a lawyer for Jean Gotti. And the the uh, mafia very much prized these posters <laughs> or the lawyers for the mafia to try and keep them from saying too much. But anybody who has some kind of business that they do not want in proprietary information to get around, you know, get away from uh, by espionage posters. Yeah, the, the the basic message of keeping um, industrial keeping, keeping quiet. Yes, exactly. exactly. Okay. 
Thank you. Oh, okay. Lawyers that. in general. I mean, you know, people like that. I just like John Gotti's lawyer a lot. Yeah, well, that's 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 a specific case. Uh, so the show is actually open um, until April the 16th for those able to come in. I will be doing a tour, I think, in early April for members. So that's an excellent reason to become a member of Poster House if you haven't already done so. Um, and um, thank you all very much for um, joining us. Thank you, Mel. Thank you. Bye all. <laughs>